You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash evidence locker and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash evidence locker. Today's show is the second of a two-part case. We recommend you listen to part one before listening to part two. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. There was no more use for Mark Schiller. The Sun Jim gang had possession of all of his assets, including his family's luxurious Miami home. The last act of the sordid play had begun. To get the final piece of the puzzle, a $2 million life insurance payout, Mark had to be dead. After more than a month in captivity, suffering daily torture, and being deprived of food and water, Mark realized the time had come for him to die. One of his captors manhandled him out of his cardboard box that had been his bed, toilet, and home for the past four weeks. He was shoved into a shower and ordered to clean up. In the preceding days, his kidnappers forced him to consume large amounts of alcohol. This made Mark wretch, as he was a teetotaler. He had not touched alcohol since college. In a drunken stupor, they would force him into his car, go for a drive, and then return to the warehouse and force him back into his box. Mark couldn't quite understand why they were doing this, but the plan was about to be revealed. They forced him to drink a potent concoction of tequila, vodka, chocolate liqueur, and sleeping tablets. In the early morning hours of December 15th, the gang then put him into the passenger seat of his own car, as they had practiced in the days before. Schiller was unconscious within a minute, and Adrian Dorbel and Carl Weeks followed in another car as Danny Lugo drove Mark's. It was late and quiet when they arrived at a predetermined spot about a mile from the Miami-Dade police station. Danny Lugo stepped on the gas and drove Mark's car into a utility pole, staging a motor vehicle accident. With help from Adrian, Danny then moved Mark's comatose body across to the driver's seat. It was perfect. Mark reeked of booze. It would look like he was a drunken driver who had lost control of his vehicle and crashed the car. And to make sure Mark wouldn't walk away alive, they doused his body in the interior of his car with gas, placed a propane tank in the trunk, and lit it on fire. They ran away to the safety of the other car, where Carl Weeks was waiting. The three sat and watched excitedly as flames bulged out of Mark Schiller's car, enveloping the sleeping man inside. Mark Schiller's SUV was engulfed in flames while Danny Lugo, Adrian Dorbel, and Carl Weeks watched in delight. It was the masterpiece of their extortion plan. Extraordinarily, however, Mark was revived by the flames and subconsciously managed to stumble out of the car. The gang could not believe their eyes. Adrian shouted, Run him over! Run him over! Carl stepped on the accelerator and aimed straight at Mark, who was stumbling away from the burning vehicle. The van missed Mark with the first go. Carl aimed again, and this time, he hit Mark and drove over him. Carl was ready to get out of there, but Danny and Adrian shouted, No, no, go back! Run him over again! Run him over again! The van reversed and doubled back over Mark. That should have finished the job. Surely, he had to be dead. When the three men in the van saw the headlights of an approaching vehicle, they sped off. Amazingly, Mark Schiller was still alive. The driver of the car that scared the gang away, 
called an ambulance that was on the scene within minutes. The next day, Mark woke up in the emergency rooms of Jackson Memorial Hospital, hardly able to move. His pelvis was shattered, his bladder burst, and surgeons had removed his spleen. He lost about 40 pounds, or 18 kilograms, during his time in captivity and appeared meek and frail. He struggled to get the message through to hospital staff that he had been kidnapped. They were convinced that he was a drunk driver who was responsible for his own injuries. End of story. Because of the cocktail the gang had forced him to drink, first responders noted the undeniable stench of alcohol on him. Mark managed to call his lawyer, Gene Rosen, from the hospital bed and told him about his kidnapping. He said that he was scared that Danny and the gang would come to the hospital and finish the job. Gene Rosen was blown away by Mark's story, but knew that this wasn't something his client would make up. Mark also asked Gene to call his sister Michelle in New York and tell her what had happened to him. Reacting to the call, Mark's siblings Michelle and Alex came to Miami as soon as they could to support their brother and try to make sense of his strange story. On Mark's instruction, his siblings called credit card companies to put a stop to the Sun Jim gang's infiltration into his finances. He managed to save a balance of 40000 but completely blocking the account could alert Danny Lugo that Mark was still alive, so he was reluctant to do so. Gene Rosen realized that immediate action to protect Mark was essential. In the past, he had used the services of a private investigator, Ed Dubois, who was a former FBI agent, and felt that he was the right man to help protect his client. Ed felt that Mark's concerns were spot on, but having a security guard to watch over him was not the answer. And if Danny and the gang wanted to make sure he was dead, a guard at the door wouldn't stop them. They would probably kill him too. Besides, 24-hour protection came at a steep price. Ed Dubois advised Mark to leave Miami as soon as possible. With Mark's brother and sister by his side, the three siblings came up with a plan. They understood the urgency and booked Mark on a $6,000 air ambulance flight to New York. Meanwhile, the guys from the Sun Gym scoured the newspapers to read about Mark's so-called accident. The final confirmation that they could go and cash in the life insurance that they had taken out on his life. But there was nothing about an accident in any newspaper. Eventually, they realized that he must still be alive, and it didn't take them long to track him down. Disguised as hospital staff, Danny Lugo, Adrian Dorble, and Carl Weeks arrived at the Jackson Memorial Hospital and made their way through the halls, searching every ward, desperately looking for Mark Schiller. If they found him, the plan was for Adrian to suffocate Mark with a pillow while the others created a diversion by starting a fight. The gang arrived at the hospital at 10 a.m. Fortunately, Mark's flight left for New York at 8 a.m. They had just missed him. Mark spent another week at Staten Island University Hospital. In his time there, the doctors approached him to discuss his condition. Mark was completely in the dark. The doctors informed him that the hospital in Miami had contacted them and told them that he was HIV positive. He couldn't believe it. Did Danny Lugo and his men inject him with something while he was unconscious? Nothing was impossible. Mark was in shock and demanded they tested him again. With the dark cloud of the HIV test results hanging over his head, Mark was released from the hospital on Christmas Eve. He spent Christmas at his sister's home in Long Island. His wife Diana and their children joined him in New York, and it was an emotional reunion. Diana was relieved to see him, and was as shocked as her husband was that Jorge Delgado had betrayed him. What could have possessed him to hate Mark so much after their years of close friendship? After an agonizing wait of five weeks, Schiller learned that he was HIV negative after all. Mark was on the mend and ready for revenge. He tasked Miami PI Ed Dubois with investigating Danny Lugo's gang. He knew Danny and Jorge were running the show, but there were more people involved too. Ed started his investigation by following the money. He saw that all the documents signing over Schiller's assets were notarized by the Sun Jim owner, John Meese. Ed actually knew John as they had been at high school together. Ed had also done some investigative work for John in the past. He found it hard to believe that John could be a criminal mastermind. He was a decent, hard-working guy, not a scheming brute. Ed had to speak to John directly to find out why he notarized all the documents that had bled Mark Schiller's estate dry. 
When they met in February of 1995, John assured Ed that there had to be a misunderstanding. He remembered notarizing the documents, but a Latin man with an ID identifying him as Marcello Schiller came with Daniel Lugo on the day. Ed presented a photo of Mark Schiller. John shrugged it off. You know, all those Latinos look alike. Ed Dubois wasn't about to give up. He confronted him with the deeds to Schiller's house that was signed over to D&J International. Diana Schiller left the country on the 18th of November, yet the contract was signed on the 23rd and 24th of November. There was no way that Diana signed this for real. Mark Schiller's shrewd plan to entrap the gang was now in front of John in black and white. John Misi was adamant it was all a misunderstanding and that Danny Lugo and Jorge Delgado would straighten it out. They planned to meet at John's Miami Lakes office near the Sun Gym. When Ed Dubois and his bodyguard arrived for the meeting, John, Danny, and Jorge were not there. Ed waited in an unused office and noticed an ashtray full of cigarette butts and two champagne flutes. It looked like someone was in that office the night before. Ed and his bodyguard had a look around and noticed some documents in the trash can. They had paid her. In the trash were copies of documents with Mark Schiller's name on it, copies of checks and transfers, proof that the gang paid off their accomplices. There was even a copy of a check Danny Lugo had paid for his court-ordered restitution relating to his fraud crimes in the early 1990s. The documents tied John Meese, Danny Lugo, Adrian Dorbel, and Jorge Delgado to Mark Schiller, confirming Mark's story. Someone must have thrown it away the night before, thinking the cleaners would have emptied it before their meeting with Ed. Ed stuffed the documents in his jacket pockets and pants, hoping no one would realize what he had found. Jorge Delgado finally arrived without Danny Lugo. He promised Ed that the gang would give all assets back to Mark Schiller. On one condition, though. Mark would have to sign a contract, stating that he would never tell the story of what had happened to him, not to anyone, especially not to police. Realizing that the gang had no way to legally enforce Mark's silence, he signed the contract. After four months, Mark had not received anything from the gang. In fact, in this time, they cleared out Mark's house. Renting a U-Haul, they loaded up everything they could. A 50-inch TV, Persian rugs, paintings, the jacuzzi, even the Schiller family albums. By the time Mark's home was in his name again, it was an empty shell. There was nothing left inside. Danny Lugo and his thugs had divided the loot, moved it into their apartments, and stored excess items in Jorge Delgado's warehouse, the same warehouse where Mark was kept and tortured. The time for Mark Schiller to report the gang to the police was way overdue. But investigators were skeptical. Why did Mark wait so long to report the kidnapping? They also found the story very hard to believe. Surely Mark was hiding something. A wealthy Latino man from South America kidnapped and extorted? His family exiled to Colombia? It sounded like a drug-related crime to them. Realizing that police didn't believe him, Mark Schiller decided to leave the USA and go to Colombia to be with his family and focus on rebuilding his life instead of seeking vengeance against the Sun Jim gang. Throughout the first couple of months of 1995, the gang lived their luxurious lives, spending Mark Schiller's money, driving his cars, and wearing his jewelry. The gang frequented a strip club in Miami called Solid Gold. Danny Lugo began a relationship with an ex-penthouse model turned stripper, Sabrina Petrescu. Petrescu was runner-up Miss Romania in 1990 and snuck into America via Mexico inside the trunk of a car. Sabrina was beautiful, but very gullible. Before long, the two had a full-blown love affair. All this while Danny was still married to Lucretia Goodridge, Adrian Dorbel's cousin. Lucretia was pregnant with Danny's second child at this time. But Danny became obsessed with Sabrina. He hated to share her with the regular crowd at Solid Gold and asked her to quit her job and put her up in an upmarket apartment on Main Street in Miami Lakes. He also gave her Diana Schiller's BMW to drive around town. Sabrina couldn't believe her luck. She loved being Danny's lover and spending his, well, Mark Schiller's, money. Sabrina was vaguely suspicious of Danny's strange behavior and frequent trips to the Bahamas. He needed to keep her quiet, so he confided in her that he was actually a CIA agent. He had stories of sting operations gone wrong, and Sabrina fell for them. 
She found the notion of dating an international man of mystery sexy and exciting. When Danny paged her, the code 007 would appear on her beeper. Danny and his gang weren't used to the high-rolling lifestyle, and they were quickly burning through Mark Schiller's money. They needed more. It was time to find their next benefactor. One night, Adrian Dorbel visited his stripper girlfriend Beatrice Whalen's home and saw a photo of her and Frank Griga. Beatrice told him that Frank was her ex-boyfriend and that he was loaded. When Adrian saw a photo of Frank standing next to a $250,000 yellow Lamborghini Diablo, he knew he had found the gang's next victim. Frank Griga, born to a Hungarian diplomat in Berlin, came to New York in the mid-1980s when he was 21 years old. He arrived with $10 in his pocket and was determined to make it big in his adoptive country. He started by working at a car workshop, doing oil changes, cleaning cars, and any other tasks that needed doing at the service station. In 1988, he moved to Miami where he worked as a car salesman, selling luxury cars at Prestige Imports in North Miami Beach. He was still on the sidelines, seeing how the other half lived. Then Lady Luck smiled on Frank Griga. He joined a group of investors who saw opportunity in pay-per-minute phone lines, and the money came rolling in. Thanks to phone sex lines like 976-TITS, 9-ROMANCE, and 1-800-GET-WILD, at the age of 26, Frank started to make big money. He loved to splurge on expensive toys. In the garage of a $700,000 waterfront mansion in Golden Beach were sports cars that some people only ever dream of driving. A rare Royal Blue Vector, a red Dodge Viper, a blue Dodge Stealth, and his beloved yellow Lamborghini Diablo. He also owned a yacht, aptly named Foreplay, seeing as the source of his riches was sex lines. But Frank Griega's most prized possession was his living 23-year-old Hungarian girlfriend, Christina Furton. Christina was a beautiful girl who loved animals, swimming, and had dreams of being a professional diver. But as a migrant, the quickest way to make good money without a social security number was to take a job as an exotic dancer. She met Frank at a club where she was working. Like Frank, Christina remained in close contact with her family in Hungary. Frank spoke with his sister, Zuzana Griga, in Budapest on a daily basis and sent money to support her and his mother. When Christina's family visited them in Miami, Frank paid for their flight and all other expenses. He was kind and generous and enjoyed spending time with friends and family. Adrian Dorbel became obsessed with Frank after he saw that picture of the yellow Lamborghini. The Sun Jim gang had their new target and stalked him as they were concocting their next kidnapping and extortion plan. Adrian kept pestering his girlfriend to introduce him to Frank Griga. Beatrice set up a meeting between Adrian and her ex-husband, Attila Wayland, who moved in the same circles as Frank. Adrian told Attila about a proposed business deal and that he wanted to approach Frank. He needed Attila Wayland to make an introduction. Attila saw dollar signs and agreed. In May, Christina Furton arranged a surprise birthday party for Frank at his Golden Beach mansion. One of the guests was Attila Wayland. As soon as he got a word alone with Frank, he told him about some guys who would like to pitch a business idea to him and arranged to bring them around to Frank's house the next day. Danny Lugo and Adrian Dorbel donned their best clothes for their meeting with Frank. They wore expensive suits and draped themselves in bling. In fact, Adrian was wearing Mark Schiller's presidential Rolex. Frank remarked to Attila Wayland that these guys knew how to make an impression. Things kicked off well. Frank was eager to hear more about their business idea. Danny did most of the talking, presenting him with official pie charts and statistics, but there was no deal. The gang wanted to repeat what they had done with Mark Schiller and use the business pitch to scope out Frank's house and gain his trust. Danny and Adrian were on cloud nine. The meeting could not have gone better. Frank took the bait and agreed to meet them again the following day. The plan was to abduct Frank and his girlfriend, Christina. Danny recruited his own girlfriend, Sabrina Petrescu, to be a part of the abduction. He made her believe that Frank was a tax offender and that Danny, as a CIA agent, had instructions to bring Frank in. Sabrina loved being part of this covert mission and went along with whatever Danny asked her to do. Before meeting with Danny and Adrian again, Frank told his sister that he had a bad feeling about the bodybuilding businessmen. 
but agreed to go out to dinner with the pair one last time before he walked away from the deal. Thursday, the 25th of May, 1995, was the day before Memorial Day weekend, and Frank and Christina were supposed to go on a trip to the Bahamas the following day. Frank's neighbor and a friend joined the couple and the burly businessman at Frank's house for drinks before dinner that night. They said their goodbyes as Frank and Christina left in his yellow Lamborghini to follow Danny and Adrian in their rented Mercedes. This was the last time anyone would see the Hungarian couple alive. As the group arrived for their dinner at Shula Steakhouse in Miami Lakes, the gang acted surprised that the restaurant was closed. In fact, they knew that this would be the case. It was all part of the ploy to lure Frank and Christina to Adrian's apartment, which was conveniently situated across the road. Danny's army of delinquents was ready for action. The plan was to drug their victims with horse tranquilizer. This would incapacitate them and make it easier to move them to a warehouse in the cover of night where they would follow the same procedure as they did with Mark Schiller. Frank and Christina did not see through the ruse and went along to Adrian's apartment. Once inside, Adrian took Frank to the bedroom to discuss the deal, but in the scuffle to tranquilize him, he held Frank in a chokehold and accidentally killed him. Christina overheard the commotion in the next room and knew they had harmed Frank. She started screaming, fearing for her own safety. Danny grabbed her and injected her with the tranquilizer. She was unconscious in a matter of seconds. They were adamant to extract information from Christina that could give them access to Frank's millions. Adrian dragged Frank's body to the bathroom and loaded him into the bath. Danny and Adrian waited all night, wondering what to do next. Christina only came to the next morning and was confused about where she was. She asked the men who were watching over her about Frank, and they told her that he was okay, but that they needed the security code for Frank's home. Christina, who spoke broken English in the best of circumstances, mumbled a code, which Danny wrote down eagerly. When Christina became agitated, and demanded to know what was going on and asked where Frank was again, Adrian injected her with another dose of tranquilizer to keep her subdued. Danny went to Frank's home in Golden Beach, hopeful that he would be able to get inside and fill his pockets with cash. Adrian and Jorge stayed behind to keep watch over Frank's body and a slumbering Christina. To kill time while they waited for Danny to return, the men played video games on Mark Schiller's 55-inch TV. At Frank's house, Danny got stuck with the code. He called Adrian and said he had to get the correct code from Christina. When Adrian tried to wake her up, he realized that she had also died. Adrian told Danny on the phone, Oh, Danny, man, the bitch is cold. Adrian had to admit that he had given Christina a third shot of horse tranquilizer. The overdose killed her. Later, it was discovered that Christina had so much tranquilizer in her system, it would have been enough to kill four 1,000-pound, or 450 kilogram horses. Danny returned, and the three men were stumped. In Adrian's apartment were two dead bodies, and they had no money to show for it. The plan had backfired badly. Danny and Jorge went home and left Adrian to spend the night alone in his apartment with two corpses and the air conditioning turned on full blast. The next morning, Jorge showed up at the apartment with a U-Haul truck. It was moving day, or so the neighbors thought. The gang cut open Mark Schiller's black leather couch and stuffed Frank Griega's body inside of it. Christina Furton's body was shoved into a moving box. They loaded the couch, box, and some other boxes into the truck, arousing no suspicion at all. With all the loot from Mark's place being carried in there over the preceding months, this probably looked like any other day at Adrian Dorbel's place. While Jorge waited at his rented warehouse in Hialeah with Frank and Christina's bodies, Danny and Adrian headed to Home Depot for some DIY dismemberment shopping. On their list was red plastic cleaning buckets, floor fans, industrial strength towels, plastic bags, propane gas tanks, face goggles and gardening gloves, a black iron security gate, a fire extinguisher, and an 18-inch petrol-powered chainsaw. They paid with Adrian's American Express credit card. When Frank's housekeeper entered the house the next morning, she heard Frank's dog Chopin barking inside. This was unusual, as the dog would never be left unattended. Frank and Christina were supposed to be in Freeport, which meant Chopin was supposed to be at the kennels. The housekeeper had a strong sense that something was wrong. She called for a neighbor, and together they walked through the house. When the women entered the house, signs of Chopin acting out were everywhere. It was a mess. 
Frank and Christina's passports and airline tickets were still at home, on his desk. In the lounge were two empty glasses, the exact ones the businessman had left when the neighbor had visited two nights before. The women realized the Hungarian couple had not been home since their dinner with the bodybuilders. They never left for the Caribbean and had vanished into thin air. Frank's neighbor remembered the group was heading for Shula's Steakhouse and drove to Main Street looking for Frank's recognizable yellow Lamborghini. She could not see it anywhere. Then, something caught her eye. It was the same Mercedes that she saw Danny and Adrian in. She took down the license plate number and called Golden Beach Police Department, who sent Chief Stanley Kramer to Frank's house to investigate. Back at the warehouse in Hialeah, the Sun Jim gang prepared for the dismemberment of Frank and Christina. They constructed a slaughter table of sorts. By placing the security gate on top of two metal oil drums, Danny and Jorge kept their distance and said that they would keep watch. Adrian was happy to sign up for the grisly job. But there was a problem. The brand new chainsaw wouldn't work. Danny was furious. He packed the chainsaw back into its box, got into his car, and drove to Home Depot to return the faulty purchase. This time, he wouldn't make the same mistake. He swapped it for an electric chainsaw, a Remington power cutter. Adrian was ready to go and fired up the new chainsaw and dismembered Christina's body first. Danny and Jorge went outside. After a couple of minutes, the buzzing of the chainsaw stopped. It turns out, Christina's hair became entangled in the chain. It wouldn't work anymore. And Danny didn't want to make another trip to Home Depot. So they had to finish the job with the backup hatchet, the knife, and the pliers. Danny and Adrian always loved watching crime shows. Danny's favorite show in the 1980s was Miami Vice with Don Johnson. They knew this was the point where they had to obscure identifying body parts, like fingerprints and teeth. After skinning both skulls to remove facial features, Adrian pulled the teeth out, one by one. Then they cut off the fingerprints, meticulously, with a six-inch knife. They had to destroy all identifying body parts and threw all of it in one of the oil drums. Danny squirted some fuel onto the flesh and bone and lit it. All that was left to do was to dump the metal drums. To help them, they called in another muscle man from the Sun Gym, Little Mario Gray. Together, they took the metal drums containing Frank and Christina's body parts to the Everglades of Miami and dropped them at different spots. With the bodies disposed of, the gang had to get rid of Frank's yellow Lamborghini. It was not an easy car to drive, and Jorge was given the keys. The gang drove in convoy, and as luck would have it, Frank's friend Lloyd Alvarez, who had met Danny and Adrian at Frank's house on the night of the dinner, saw them. Lloyd knew it was Frank's Lamborghini, but he did not recognize the driver. In the car driving behind the Lamborghini, however, he saw the bodybuilding businessman he had met at Frank's house. Lloyd immediately drove to the nearest police station and reported the incident. The gang found a spot in a wooded area and abandoned the car with the key still inside off the Florida Turnpike, west of Miami. When the Lamborghini was discovered by a state trooper, police intensified their search for Frank and Christina. By the weekend, the couple had been missing for eight days. Police had interviewed family and friends and were alarmed when they heard Danny Lugo and Adrian Dorbel's names. They remembered them from Mark Schiller's case and called Ed Dubois. Ed, in turn, called Mark in Columbia and simply said, they did it again. Miami police also called Mark Schiller and asked him to come back to Florida to assist them with information. Mark arrived back in Miami from Columbia on Friday, the 2nd of June. He cooperated in every way he could and identified Danny Lugo from a photo lineup. Police realized that Schiller's case was like a blueprint of what must have happened to Frank and Christina after they disappeared. The theory was that the Sun Jim Gang's victims were still alive and being tortured. They searched Adrian Dorbel's apartment and using luminol, they found blood evidence in the bedroom where he had killed Frank Riga. There was too much blood to assume Frank was still alive. On Saturday, June 3rd, at 7 a.m., 75 Miami-Dade police officers swooped across Miami, armed with a stack of warrants. Jorge Delgado was arrested at his home. Linda was so distraught she did the unthinkable and asked Mark Schiller for help. She was knocking on the wrong door. Mark would never forgive Jorge for causing this whole hurricane of violence and destruction. Next to be arrested was Adrian Dorbel. He did not resist arrest 
as he was either too arrogant or too stupid to think that the police were only taking him in for questioning. Danny Lugo had already left for Nassau in the Bahamas a week before. He left with his parents and his girlfriend, Sabrina Petrescu. Police tracked him down at the Hotel Montague and escorted him back to Miami to face the music. John Misi was tactfully escorted out by police during the National Physique Committee's Florida Men's State Championship at the Knight Center in downtown Miami. Police also searched the Sun Jim Gang's homes and found numerous items belonging to Mark Schiller. His ID was brazenly kept at Danny Lugo's house, irrefutably tying him to the crimes Mark had accused him of. On his second night in custody, Danny Lugo was ready to talk. He revealed the location of some of the barrels containing Frank and Christina's body parts. He thought he could outsmart the police and only revealed where they had dumped the torsos, not the identifying heads or hands. But police found breast implants in the female torso and were able to trace it back to Christina. They used the serial number on the implants and compared it with her medical records and found that it matched. The Sun Jim Gang's trial began on February 24, 1998. It took six months to review the 1,200 items of evidence. The gang had so many charges stacked up against them, it took an hour to read the indictment. Mark Schiller felt empowered that he could testify against all of them in court. He read a powerful victim impact statement outlining the torture that he had endured. He told them how his family had suffered and how he would take the scars, both physical and psychological, to his grave. He felt very strongly that none of them deserved to live normal lives in society ever again. In the end, all of the members of the Sun Jim Gang were convicted. John Meesey was sentenced to 56 years in prison for kidnapping and extortion of Mark Schiller. In June of 2002, he received a further 30 years imprisonment for conspiracy to commit racketeering. He died of natural causes in prison in 2004. For his role in Schiller's kidnapping, Carl Weeks was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Steven St. Pierre's sentence was only 7 years. Like his paycheck, his sentence also reflected his reduced involvement in Schiller's extortion and kidnapping. It only took the jury 14 minutes to deliberate and return a guilty verdict for Danny Lugo on all counts and sentenced him to death. He is currently in the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford in North Central Florida not quite as glamorous as Golden Beach, Miami. The jury took 18 minutes to decide Adrian Dorbel's fate. Guilty on all counts, and like Danny, also a death sentence. He is currently on death row and has exhausted his appeals. Jorge Delgado turned against the gang and became a pivotal state witness. He served only nine years in prison for his crimes against Mark Schiller, Frank Griega, and Christina Furton, walking free in 2007. But in 2008, he was convicted again for grand theft. He walked into a Kmart in Miami and attempted to return over $7,000 worth of stolen merchandise. He pleaded guilty and received one year's probation. In a somber twist of fate, Jorge Delgado wasn't done with his vendetta against Mark Schiller. He accused Mark of fraudulent business associated with one of his own companies. As Mark Schiller left the courthouse after his testimony against the gang, he was arrested by FBI agents for Medicare fraud. An investigation proved that Mark had used his nutrition supplement business to rack up over $14 million in false Medicare claims. Judge Alex Ferrer, TV's Judge Alex who presided over the Sun Jim Gang's case, testified in favor of Schiller at his trial. This is a very unusual move. He felt that Schiller had been tortured worse than any prisoner of war and felt that he had paid his dues to society in a way far worse than any prison sentence could make him pay. Schiller served 46 months in jail, the minimum sentence one can get for Medicare fraud. The plot of these crimes was so outrageous that Hollywood director Michael Bay adapted the story into a screenplay for a dark action comedy called Pain and Gain. In the film, Mark Wahlberg plays the smooth, smiling, scheming Danny Lugo, and Dwayne Johnson's character was inspired by a mixture of traits displayed by Carl Weeks, Big Mario, and Steven St. Pierre. Mark Schiller's character is depicted as being a real pain in the backside, very far from the soft-spoken and intelligent real-life victim. 
the film was made for entertainment and not factual reporting. What it did get right was to give an insight into exactly how ridiculous and dumb the perpetrators were. Nothing that happened to Mark Schiller is a laughing matter, and even less so what happened to Frank Grieg and Christina Furton. Mark Schiller even filed a lawsuit against the producers for betraying him as a character that had something like this heinous crime coming to him. He also hit back by writing the book Pain and Gain, The Untold True Story. This proves that truth still is stranger than fiction. Mark Schiller lives in Boca Raton, Florida, and works as a tax resolution specialist. Police retrieved some of his valuables, like the Schiller's honeymoon photo album, which was found in Adrian Dorbel's apartment. As for his money, the gang spent most of it, and he had to start from scratch. Today, the Sun Gym does not exist anymore. It is used as a warehouse for a perfume wholesale company. Jorge Delgado's warehouse of torture is now an Argentinian bakery. The owner was unaware of the history of this place at the time of purchase. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe an Apple podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're waiting for our next episode, why not listen to one of our podcasting friends? Welcome to Nordic True Crime. We are a bi-weekly podcast covering a wide range of crimes from Europe's most northern countries. So, if you're after a smorgasbord of real crime from the dark and frozen regions of the Nordics, then give us a try. Find us on iTunes or at nordictruecrime.podbean.com on Twitter and Facebook at Nordic True Crime or on your podcast provider. And as we say in Sweden, ta hand om dig. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.